Welcome to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast with your hosts, Henry Doyle and Ryan Taylor, where we discuss all things related to outdoor and nature photography. In today's episode, Henry and Ryan talk about all things ethics in terms of photography, including but not limited to wildlife and the environment. We hope you enjoy the show. All right. Welcome back to episode 13, and we've got a very interesting topic today. So today's episode is about, uh, basically about outdoor photography and ethics. And that means anything with approaching wildlife to the environment and just basically being a good steward and taking care of our surroundings and at the same time getting a great photograph as well. Mm -hmm. Because in our opinion, part of nature photography isn't just, you know, abusing nature and animals to get the best shot. It's also being in nature and participating in it positively. Yeah, and leaving it better than you found it in most cases, if you can. Yes. So yeah, how do you avoid, all right? How do you best so, avoid disturbing wildlife in the environment? Would you say, Henry? Well, what I, I try to do is um, I just try to be very careful, so I won't run through the forest if I see an animal, um, even if it's a really great animal and I could get a good shot if I, you know, was kind of aggressive and kind of move towards it. Um, I always try to just be very careful, try not to disturb what they're doing. Um, because I know there are some animals that if there's too much contact with humans, they'll, you know, they'll, some even starve. I've heard like the, for bunnies, for example, if you get too close to baby bunnies, um, the mother will literally shun the babies and the babies will die because of the human contact. So I, I just basically try to be careful and let the animals do what they're doing. Um, I know some uh, like wildlife photographers will even scare birds to get like a bird in flight shot. And I just, I no. can't imagine doing that. It's just, you're photographing a natural subject in nature. It's not like it's a portrait. You're not posing it. You're working with what it's doing and getting a shot out of that if you can. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know about... I mean, some people, maybe sociopaths, I don't know. Like if I took an image, like you're saying, of like a bird in flight, and it was a gorgeous image on its own, I feel like the guilt would just eat me inside just because every time I'd look at the image, I'd think about, man, I really should have not done that, you know, spook that bird so it can get in flight. So it's just, that's what ethics is all about to me. It's all about right from wrong, what's morally questionable. And if you have to really question it, should you really do it in most cases? I mean, probably not. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um and also just kind of another thing, I try to be generally quiet around animals. Number one, they might fly away or walk away if, you know, you get too loud. But also, um, it's just very, you can really scare animals. And sometimes they just sit there in shock. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I know deer, for example, I don't know. Like you can tell sometimes deer get really scared and they just kind of stand there. And just kind of they get know, look at, Yeah. They, they get kind of like frozen almost, but they're like kind of fidgety at the same time. Like they will just stand there, stare at you, kind of like cock their head to the side. And you ever see them do like that stomping they do? Usually it's the male that does it. It's, it's pretty fascinating, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And do you, is there any kind of specific, any other specific things you do, Ryan? Like do you wear certain clothing to not disturb them? Because – I know I've seen pictures of you in like a big ghillie suit before. That's probably <laughs> more for your own sake than the animals, but is yeah, it's it's kind of several fold with it. Um, there's really, I wish there was an easy answer, but it's not. But um, I do agree, like you're saying about just being very quiet overall, just because it you know I feel like it heightens the experience and makes it much more uh, makes you appreciate really what's around you, um, and it also like you said doesn't really scare off the wildlife as easily. If you're just yelling and making a bunch of noise and stomping around, throwing things, and that's stuff I've seen plenty of times from other people, um, which you know I don't get. But anyways, mm -hmm. um, I guess let's just run with the example of the deer here. Um, more often than not, because you know no one's perfect, of course. More often than not, the deer will hear both hear and see me before you know I hear and see them. And so in that case, they might run off immediately. They might stay on their ground for a while. Um, so I don't do anything to you know, provoke or, you know, have any kind of hostile manner towards the, you know, the deer in this case. Um, I just kind of walk quietly. I might stare at them a little bit just to see how many there are out of curiosity. Um, I probably won't take a photograph. It just, 
because you just get less of a candid look at them. They always look more scared. Um, not always, but you know, it's my preference. Staring straight into your soul. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a few, I will say I got a few amazing, just like headshots literally of them, portraits of them. But, um, overall I like a more natural pose, um, mm -hmm. if I can, but I know it's hard with deer since they're have such good hearing. Um, but I would just, even then, if they see me and hear me, um, I'm just going to, you know, I'll look around to see how many there are and I'll just quietly walk my way. And this actually happened the other day. It was a really rainy day. I was pretty out deep in this woodland kind of wet woods, um, near my, my part of the uh, state here in Ohio. And I found probably about six, six to eight of them. And they're on the side of the trail. I, once I kind of saw them at least, cause I just saw some movement and they're all staring at me already. <laughs> Um, I just kind of looked around at them. Like I said, it was pouring rain, not too heavy at least, but, and I just kept on walking my way and just kind of left them alone. So mm -hmm. it's not worth, well, it, lighting speaking and exposure, it wasn't worth getting a shot, but also I just didn't feel kind of right, you know, taking a shot in that case. It just wasn't. Worth and I mean, sometimes, you know, you can even get good shots of animals if you just kind of sit there and just don't interact with them whatsoever. Like for example, today there was some, a family of ducks, like a family of four ducks. I was out in the woods and, um, you know, I could have chased after them and got in a shot. Um, but I decided just to wait in this one spot. I climbed down to the Creek and like sat right by the water. I just waited for maybe five minutes and then they literally just, you know, swam right past me and literally got like right up like 10 feet, no, not 10 feet, probably like six feet away from me. Oh, wow. um, so I was able to get some great shots of them. And they just weren't bothered by me because I wasn't being intimidating. So sometimes I'd say, or I'd, I'd even argue most of the time, you get better shots just by being present instead of, you know, making your presence known to the animals. Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's a fine line between making your presence known without being obnoxious about it. And um, that uh -huh. example is great. Um, were you actually at like a community park by any chance or... Uh, I was, kind of I mean, remote. I guess it's kind of community park, but it, it was pretty, pretty remote. Um, there was no one around. I was just kind of down in a Creek. It wasn't really on a trail. Uh, I had to like walk the Creek to get there, but. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, cause um, I find in my experience, you know, with ducks and geese at ponds, if it's like a much more busier, like a community park, like I said, pond, uh, they're much more likely to just walk right by you. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually yeah. See. I don't think these. I don't think these guys were because they they definitely seemed very wild, and I never see people out there. So, oh um, yeah, I'm not yeah. saying they're not wild. It's just like they're much more um, familiar with people, and they will. Yeah, because I've had this. Um, there's a local. Uh, it's called Spring Lakes Park in my area, and it's a pretty popular fishing destination. It's got a decent sized lake, and there's actually a. I think it's. I believe it's a gray lag goose, um, which is a pretty largely sized goose that um, is usually domesticated. And I, it, it'll literally just walk right by you. I mean, you could reach out and touch it. It does not care. Wow. And it like lives at this park. It's so neat. Yeah. So I've got some really up close shots of it. I mean, that, that's neat, but I also feel bad for the goose, all those hands that's had to touch it, you know? Well, yeah, I don't think anyone's touching it necessarily, but yeah, I'm just saying, <laughs> okay. yeah, no, no, I didn't, no, no, I'm not, I'm not um, advocating touching it. I'm just saying like, I'm giving context. Mm. Yeah. It's just that yeah. it, it will, it has at least, I'll be sitting on a bench or something and it'll just walk right by me. Or where you waddle, honey, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So yeah, um, other things I do, um, I will wear more earth tone uh, colors if I can. Like if it's hunting season, I'm on a hike. I may have to wear <laughs> brighter colors. Um, just obviously, with yeah. The carrier. Yeah, <laughs> I think we all have those freaky stories of that. No, no offense to animals. I'd rather scare an animal than get shot. So. I, this is a little uh, tangent here, like we always do, but um, I remember one time I went to this a couple of years ago. So it was pretty early on in my um, nature, I guess, photography experience, but I went to a local wildlife area, a state wildlife area, and I went during hunting season. I did not even prepare. I'm wearing like <laughs> earth tone colors because that's just what I prefer. And I'm like walking around. There's couple there's maybe like two other cars in the parking lot but you know i'm just kind of thinking myself oh, i'm just here to photograph birds and mammals and <laughs> i'm creeping around it's quiet as can be and then i turn to my right and there's just a guy like staring at me sitting on his like butt it's just like in a ghillie suit and he's just staring at me and i'm like freaked out uh -huh. <laughs> i didn't say a word i just kind of jumped and jumped and i just kept on walking after does he think like does he think he 
I'm prey or a fellow hunter. Or, you know. He's probably like, what the heck is this guy doing? Is that like a camera or a gun? I can't tell. This. Or a bow? I don't know what he's doing. Oh, my. Yeah, it's that, that, that'll make your, your heart race. But <laughs> anyways, um, so yeah, I just it's all about common sense, at least I think. But then again, I've, I've seen the worst of it. I've seen – I've seen good stories or just things happen and unfold before me, but you know, it's just about common sense, I think with this sort of topic. Yeah, I agree. Um, So I think that's pretty much covers it for that question. So our next one is somewhat similar, but it more involves kind of the natural plant life and tree life that you'll see out in these natural areas. So will you go off trail to get an amazing shot? Um, perf- the short answer is no, preferably no. I'm actually, I'll just say no, but, um, there's a few times like I've gotten lost and maybe it's just before dark. I don't really do this now. I mean, but there's a few times early on, I would just foolishly be out way past dark. Let's say in like a woodland and it's, I can't find my way, but like I can see the exits over there, but I don't know how to get there. So I will go off trail. I understand that stuff can happen. Um, you're probably not, unless if you're in some super rare, like environment or habitat, you're probably not going to harm anything. I don't think, you know, cause you yeah, know, I, just, I just don't see anything going bad, but I'm not saying you should do that just every time. Or if you're being, let's say lazy and you're like, Oh, I don't want to go down that hill. I'll go right through this, you know, straight through this, you know, or if like, if you're aware with like a, they call them switchbacks on a hill, it's like a hiking term. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will sometimes, I, actually a lot of the times I'll see. Uh, well, let me explain. Switchbacks are basically where instead of going straight downhill or uphill, it kind of like does like a snake. It goes back and forth. Yeah, yeah like a snake, like like a uh, S curve. It just kind of winds through, and basically, that's supposed to put less stress on your body from going uphill or downhill. And so, yeah. I can't count how many times at a few metro parks I've been to where they have switchbacks, and I will see these like well-worn paths halfway down. You know, going through the pretty much shortcutting is what I call it, just shortcutting it. And it's just, it's a little disheartening because in that case, um, the trails can get eroded over time and they get ruined. So you can actually damage trail that way as well. Um, I will say though, most places you'll probably be okay doing off trail. I'm not, like I said, I'm not saying you should do it, but I'm just saying Mm -hmm. you're not, you're probably not going to harm anything, but some grass, you might step on a bug. Oh no. But there are a few places, uh, some sensitive wetland habitats because wetlands, at least in Ohio, you know, we lost 90% of them ever since, you know, the white settlers came in and there's a few places that are amazing quality wetlands. Dang white people. But, yeah. But they, uh, shame on us, but um, <laughs> they have, they have boardwalks and they have boardwalks for a reason. It's so you can go within that habitat and check the places out and it's great. And you should use that, you know, as a privilege. But they really don't condone most of the time you going off of the boardwalk because there is sensitive, you know, flora and fauna uh, at those locations. Yeah, um, so I don't want to sound like a bad person, but I do go off trail quite a bit. But I, <gasps> I will say, I will say, <laughs> I never will go off trail if it's a sensitive area. Um, I, I know a decent amount about fauna, I guess you could say. Um, taking a couple courses before and stuff. So I know what stuff could be disturbed with camp. Um, I'm just, I'm kind of a natural adventurer. And although I didn't grow up like near, like on top of nature, um, I have family that, you know, owns woods and stuff. So I would always go off trail there, you know, just explore for hours. I'm just kind of the exploratory type. So I will go off trail quite a bit. Um, but I, I am responsible about it. And like for today, for example, I was in this kind of remote area. Um, I could have walked, I walked on the creek instead of walking, um, you know, through the brush because, you know, I thought maybe that would make a little bit less of an impact. I don't know if that's true, if it did or not, but, um, (laughs) you know, I evaluate what's going on. And of course I'll walk on the trail if, you know, like I want to make it clear, like I'm not, if I see a trail, I'll walk on it. And if I see something, I will go off trail. It's not like I'm constantly off the trail. But. You don't consciously, I don't think you do. You don't consciously choose like, oh, okay, I go to this place. I'm just going to walk off trail just because. I don't think you're, <laughs> you're definitely not like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. No, 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 no. 
And I will say, and this goes with kind of like knowing your locations. Um, I believe we made an episode about this um, early on in the podcast, but uh, it's important to know uh, what kind of type of location if it's a park. Um, and what I mean is state parks, uh, for example, you can they're much more for outdoor recreation. They're much more, I would say, more relaxed and casual. And I'm not saying, once again, you should go off trail, but I'm just saying the environment's much more uh, you could say rugged and it's much more allows a lot greater group of people to go through it. But like first is a state nature preserve, which is a preserve, you know, it's protected by the state and, you know, probably the federal government that's much more conserved for important reasons like, you know, scientific study and appreciation by people that I would hope take care of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and of course, if there's signs that say, do not go off trail, I will never go off trail. Oh no. Um, it's just, you know, it's just really evaluation and, you know, there's, there's so much more terrible things you could be doing. Um, one thing, there's a couple places I know you should definitely not go off trail. Number one is I'm in this area a lot because I go up to Michigan quite a bit is, uh, dunes and dune grasses. Never walk on those dune grasses cause they're the, some of the most fragile plants you'll find. Um, really? Yeah, there's a big problem with that. And also that creates like sand slides or like eroding sand because when you walk, it kind of makes um, – kind of erodes the sand from the cliffs and can also cause some problems. Huh. So I know for that environment, try to stay on the trail. I did not even know that. That's interesting. I mean we don't really have those yeah. kind of grasses or dunes in Ohio <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, nothing quite – I, mean, I, mean, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say we don't have that quite the same thing but – I mean, most of what's here is woods anyways. So, but most, most places I go to, there's a couple where I've, I can think of one in particular that's a really popular spot, but I have gotten first couple of times I went legitimately lost in, and I kind of just end up going off trail, not by purposely, but just accident, honestly. Cause it's like, maybe it's, you know, midsummer and the foliage is very vibrant, but it's just covering up the trail mm-hmm. kind of cut away, like clear cut. But I mean, yeah, most of the times these places I go to, uh, I hope everywhere is like this, are pretty well laid out and you can find your way easily. Yep. And going off trail is fun, you know, too. So <laughs> if, 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 you, if nobody's going to get hurt by it, or no plants, no animals, you know, just try it every once in a while, especially if there's no trails. Look at it this way. If, if you're looking to go off trail, the one place I would be okay with it is wildlife areas because you're actually encouraged basically because you know that's yes those are particularly the primary purpose of those um is for hunters and stuff like that and they go off trail because generally there's no trails at those kind of places so those are the probably the one place um type of place in particular i'd say you know have at it but everywhere i'd say i'd say waterfalls as well Mm, there's a there's Mm. there's a couple um there's a couple of state nature preserves in my area that are like railed off, literally railed off, and you can't. Well, I, I think that's probably more for the protection of humans than the protection of the waterfalls, I would guess. Um, yes and no. It's both. Um, like I, the one I'm thinking of is Clifton Gorge, and I've seen photos. Oh, de- definitely for protection there. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, I think it's mainly, I mean, as much as I you know, don't want people to get hurt, I actually think it's more about the geological, like, uh, the rocks and everything because that's, mm-hmm. like, that's like old, you know, it's old glacial glaciate Ohio, you know, era at rocks. So I feel like, yeah. I, I feel like that's why they don't want people getting the footsteps all over and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, a couple of days ago I went to a waterfall in Indiana. It was the largest one and there, there were no signs. So I did, I did some rock climbing actually to get there and I did not break any rocks off. It was, you know, I was, I was responsible, but you know, sometimes, in my opinion, you know, it's just, yeah. There, yeah, there, there's a, there's one gorge uh, habitat and there's even a rock quarry in my area. Um, and I will admit there's a couple times I'm like, this is fun. I'll just climb some rocks all over them. I'm talking like big, like boulders and they're all just kind of piled yeah. on top of each other. Cause it used to be an old coral reef. Right. But um, you know, are you going to harm a rock necessarily? No. But I don't, I don't just do it every day necessarily either. You know, I like to stay on trails. Yeah. I, I look at it as a challenge. Look at it as like you have to take a shot, but you only have the confines of the trail. Mm-hmm. Use a telephoto lens, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I, I'd say 90% of the time I am still on the trail. Like we said earlier, it's not like I'm, say I'm doing a hike with Ryan and he's on the trail and I'm just to his left, like 10 feet away, just, you know, climbing over logs <laughs> as he's on the, you know, the <laughs> trail. But, uh, yeah. So yeah. I think that's good for that topic. So um, I guess one thing, because a, a big part of ethics is wildlife. Uh, Henry, do you use a flash to photograph any kind of wildlife? Extra, I've never, I, I'd never really played around with flashes. I only use them for portraits, really. Yeah, me too. Me too. I, I mean, it's I've tried to some very unsatisfactory results. I might add to use flash on like you could try it on deer. I don't think it's going to turn out well. They're going to freak out and run away. Um, <laughs> bird, birds are a little more forgiving. Like little, I'm talking like little songbirds. Yeah, I've I've seen some videos of people setting up like flash systems at their uh, home bird feeders and like getting some cool shots with that. The one time, or at least one good example, I will say of using a flash. Uh, let's just say in birds, this case is hummingbirds. But that's mainly so you can get a fast enough shutter speed to slow down the movement of their you know fast wing beats. Um, I tried, mm. like I said, I tried to some decent results using flash in like a woodland area, or wetland habitat with little songbirds and warblers. Um, it's not the best, mainly because I don't like the way it fills in the light necessarily. And I know you can mm. adjust the power on uh, external flashes, but it just doesn't look that good. And uh, you, you do get a nice catch light in the eye most of the time, but like it's just when you're in that deep woodland, I understand it's shadowed but the image still doesn't look good to me. And you can mm -hmm. even, and I've seen with So own, unnatural, yeah. Yeah, I just don't like the look. I'd rather not take a photograph at all. Um, I've wow. even found with my own eyes, not even just like looking through the telephoto or the camera, the viewfinder, um, I found the birds literally like cock their head to the side and they do kind of get more jumpy if they're just perched or something for a quick second. And if I shoot off that flash a couple times, they do kind of get a little more... You can just tell they get kind of more anxious because you're like, what the heck is that little flash of light, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Do you know of any negative consequences for animals with flash? You know what? I wish there was a definite answer. Um, I've always heard different things. Um, the best, I think the standard, the industry standard is to not use flash with wildlife of any kind um, simply because it's uh, – I don't really see it as necessary. I don't know. It, like it just, it feels like they would do more harm than good um, overall. And it seems to be, and this is like a universal rule, I guess, but um, they feel like it just make the wildlife more scared and anxious. And yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I just don't, I don't see it as necessary. Um, I've bought the, like I bought the rig to use them. Like I even have this thing called a better beamer. If you've heard of it, that you can attach onto an external flash and it allows you a greater range and more power behind the flash. And But I just, I don't, it's like too cumbersome of a setup when I'm on the move shooting handheld for like birds or something. So I just don't even bother with it. One thing I do know about flash though is it's pretty helpful for macro photography, I've heard. I don't know if you've tried it, but I, I'd like oh, to definitely. try it at some point. Yeah, um, I, I prefer to use natural light when I can, but early on, yeah, when I was doing macro, like flowers of any kind, wildlife are cultivated. Um, I did use a flash quite a bit just to fill in the shadow details. Um, and if we're talking ethics about that, I doubt the flower is going to get harmed. You're not stepping on it. You know, you're just shooting a little pop of light. And I mean, you can argue, mm -hmm. plants, you could argue plants are sentient beings um, since there is new research nowadays, but you're not going to stress the plant out, I don't think. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> then again, yeah, they, do, they do have like a I would, there, <laughs> there's there's so many worse things to worry about just yeah i don't think that should even be in your mind really my, my biggest fear is people pulling like sensitive wildflowers out of the ground for no good reason and i've seen stuff like yeah that. and i don't get it i'll yeah, see and there's, some, there's some photographers who'll do that they pull out flowers and then bring them inside to their studio to get that precision lighting uh, it's terrible most places prohibit wildflower picking anyways, especially sensitive areas. So you, you it's, it's, it's not like there's like law enforcement that's like there ready to arrest you. Yeah, you do but that. It's meant to deter it. So, and mm -hmm. I hope people just don't, I mean, the closest I'd done is uh, I was at this place called Med River Gorge this past spring um, for the trilliums. Um, Cause I knew gorge habitats always have little snow trilliums early, very early spring, uh, late winter area. 
time of the year. But um, I the most I did, I didn't pick it, but what I did is for a shot, I just kind of crawled away the dirt and debris around it and took a shot of it. And that's like the most I've done. And I, I don't consider that because I moved it all back when I was done after a few shots, but I, that's just more of like staging a shot to me. I don't really f- believe I was doing anything unethical. I wasn't pulling out the flower. I wasn't rearranging, you know, besides some like twigs and little debris and maybe a leaf yeah, or two. I, I, I agree. That's totally fine. I'm very, I, I like to think I'm pretty darn sensitive about these things and mm-hmm. I try to do what's right and what's, you know, not do what's wrong. Okay, the next one is crossing private property in order to get a certain photograph. Uh, or just see a new thing, basically. The, wor- <laughs> the worst I've done, well, I, it's not really bad, but like I can think of a few examples on some, uh, the Parks and Trails District in my area. They have a few places that they list on the website as permit only. So you'd have to get a permit and usually that's for like maybe a class or something you're doing. And I le- like legitimately have emailed them and asked, Hey, is so-and-so place open to the public? And they're like, yeah, it's good. You can go ahead. And I'm like, so confused by that. So like, I would just ask ahead if you're curious. Um, I'm not saying everyone's just going to say yes to your request, but uh, in my experience, you know, people just seem to, I don't want to say they don't care, but um, I just got more lucky with that. But that's, even that's not private property necessarily. It's a public place. It's just under permit. Mm-hmm. Um, would I and cross? You have to. Rem- <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> would I cross um, like someone's house to see a bird without asking? No, no, never do that. Um, I th- can't think of any other examples. Like, there's actually, oh yeah, there's actually a waterfall um, in my area. It's uh, it's called West Milton Cascades, and I've I've seen so many photographs of it. It's a very popular, very small scenic waterfall, just kind of off the side of a road. Um, and apparently the, it's been had like a change of hands, I guess, like the owners of this building nearby that own that land around it. And they legitimately like closed it off like a week or two ago. Like it says like private property, do not enter at all. So, I mean, would I cross that just to take a photo of a waterfall? I, part of me wants to, but I'm not going to do it. It's not worth it to get cited or fined or something. You know, it's just not worth it for me. Yeah. And you do have to worry about yourself as well. Yeah, it is. Yes, you are violating someone's private property, but people, there are some people who are so into it that they'll literally shoot you if you go into your property. And there's been oh, horror yeah. stories like that. Um, and, you know, I can kind of see why they might get scared. Obviously, I don't want, I don't think they should shoot us. That's too far. But, you know, we, we could have our giant telephoto lenses out and it kind of looks like a gun, honestly, our tripods <laughs> and stuff, you know, it could, could be pretty intimidating. I know if I was in my yard now, granted a photographer would never go in my yard cause it's very boring, but if I was in my <laughs> yard and I saw a photographer walk through it, I'd just be scared. Like I didn't, wouldn't know what to do. Like just be weird. Um, so you just got to keep that in mind. Um, I think there are a couple times I've, cross private property but that's when it's kind of like right by a public land kind of like you were saying um and it's like a I, I know it's like a giant forest and i just you know i was in there for a second to get a shot just get it right back out um mm-hmm. but that's, that's only i've only done that a couple times and that's in places that i know that it's not like a tiny yard it's like a natural forest you know what i mean it's like acres of land pretty much yeah yeah I think I will say if you do, let's say if you do find yourself crossing private property or you maybe pass a park boundary sign, um, just simply turn around. It's not that big of a deal. Like I doubt you're going to like I, the shooting thing is an extreme example, but I do think that could happen probably in some rural areas, depending on where you're at. Um, or well, I, I mean, I have, no, I, have no, I have no doubt that you could get easily shot. Um, like if I would say – if you can see the person's house and you're on their property, get the hell out of there. Like if, <laughs> if you're in the middle of the forest, you're fine. But if you, if you can see their house, I would just leave. It's just not worth the risk. Yeah. Yeah. It's not worth it. And um, really we should have mentioned this at the beginning, but disclaimer, um, Henry's in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm in Dayton, Ohio in the United States. So, you know, check your local jurisdictions for any of these kind of topics we're discussing because you know every place state and country is different um, i do know in the I'm actually gonna look U- it up real quick Sorry. yeah yeah go i'm gonna ahead. look it up real quick if uh, you can get shot on private property 
Uh, yeah, it's like a stand your ground law, I believe. <laughs> now we're getting the legalities here. I guess it goes hand in hand. I will say in the United Kingdom, I believe they, um, at least it's more popularized there. They have this thing called wild camping where you can basically camp freely on any private and public land. It's like the strangest thing, but I guess people do it fairly often. Mm-hmm. Usually on mountaintops or something, but um, I guess you could in theory do it anywhere. I mean, I would, I would wild camp probably. I would consider camping in a national park or something or a state park. Well, I mean, as long as, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think it's really hurting anyone as long as I'm cleaning up and leaving no trace. Um, yes, yeah, definitely. I would consider doing it. I guess what am I talking about? I kind of made a video about it, but but I mean, and that was a public park. Yeah, it was a it was a pretty surreal experience. Um, I but like I said, or like what Henry's saying, I, I left no trace. I literally, you could not tell I was there. I didn't really go anywhere off trail dramatically. Uh, even where I pitched my tent, like none of it, I didn't leave any food scraps, nothing. It was all just, I literally took pictures before and after. You don't see a difference. So you just got to do it responsibly and you should be all right, you know, both with the law and protecting the environment. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So do you geotag locations and posting on social media? So first of all, let me let you guys know what geotagging is. That's basically on Instagram or Facebook or just any of those general sites. Do you put a specific location marker? Um, I will say, because see what I, I used to do up until recently is I would put like the specific location, like tag that in my photo post. Uh, more recently, and this is honestly, it's not really to do with ethics. It's more just to do with like my global reach of my photo, you know, like my posts is I will put a general, I'll pretty much put like the nearest city, town, village, what have you. And that's mainly just to do with, so I can get like a larger audience to see my photos. It's not really necessarily to do with ethics, but um, I will say one, one prime example is if there's a sensitive location, like, you know, like an owl nest or something, you know, or some kind of, you know, threatened or endangered species, and you want to post about the nest, I would definitely advise, no, don't do that. Just don't, Yes, definitely. <laughs> you don't, you I don't mean, know. Imagine, imagine, do people actually do that? Like put the precise location of owl nests? Like, yeah, no, they, there's, uh, there, there's a whole reason there's a um, internet group called ethical uh, owl hunter or not hunters, but photographers or just people that view owls. I mean, or uh, ethical raptor shots. That's like a big popular, uh, I think it's like a hashtag in Instagram or something. Wow. Yeah. Cause it's like such a hot, heatly, contested debate because you know people are like oh did you bait that owl to get closer to it um it's like i just yeah Jeez, what i do personally is very similar to you i've been doing this pretty much since the beginning i just put like you said the general city that's closest to it and if i if it's not really near a city or anything i just put the state um for a while, I've never really done specific locations. For a while, what I did was uh, just kind of funny location names. Like for the waterfall, for waterfalls, I would just do the waterfall. And for like flowers, <laughs> I would do like flower garden. Um, but <laughs> the one negative of that was I was getting all these random, like I put like a business down. There's yeah. like a business called like the waterfall or something. And they like <laughs> DM'd me and it was just really weird. So I switched just the <laughs> general location. Please take down this waterfall photo. You're under violation. Uh, we'll find yeah. you. <laughs> it's like some country or it's like some city in Zimbabwe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I've I think noticed it was that. Abu Dhabi restaurant or something. Oh man. Yeah. If you follow uh, some of those, like somewhere in, in earth or the planet, you know, he just takes I know, Nick, much I know Nick Page, one of his biggest things, he always called people out about um, location tags. And I think he even said once that he was unfollowing anyone who did specific tags. Uh, he's kind of made that his cause in the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. It's one of those things. I, I think the biggest thing is like landscapes for me and waterfalls because uh, when I've done quite a few festivals, mainly last year, um, people would always ask me where the locations of really just kind of scenic looking spots are. And so in that case, I would tell them just because it's, it's a more of like a face-to-face thing. It's not really 
promoting something. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. I think telling a person if they ask is perfectly fine. Uh, I think sometimes, and I think Nick Page got some hate for this. Sometimes it could come out, come off as a little bit selfish. Now, I'm not personally saying it is, but some people got that impression because you know, like the photographer, there's this beautiful shot, and then these people don't know where to go. Um, but I think overall, when you have that big of followers, amount of followers. If you post a location like that, that location could get ruined easily because of the amount of reach he has. I mean, think about it. Nick Page has something like, I don't know, like hundreds of thousands of followers who most likely, most of them do landscape photography. So mm -hmm. a, a good portion of those followers would go to that location and maybe slowly degrade it over time. Yeah, I mean, that, that's important to mention is that, you know, look at your following and your influence, you know, whether it's on the web or elsewhere. And if you have a big following like Nick does, then you got to be really responsible about how you, you know, pretty much go about everything. Because, yeah, people will definitely trample all over a spot just because there's some super secret location and, you know, everyone has to go to it, of course. Yeah, definitely. So I guess I, if I had to give an answer, I'd just say uh, most places you'll be okay with tagging the specific spot or at least telling people. Uh, but like if it's a very specific, uh, say, scenario like a nest or something that's much more sensitive, um, if that makes sense, then I would not, you know, I would not even, I'd say the farthest go if like there's a nesting spot and it might be like a threatened species of like a bird or something. I would just say like maybe if you're in like the United States, I would say like the county you're in or something and maybe share that with a really small group of people that are localized. Um, but other than that, yeah. Just... And if, it, and as long as you think the people you're sharing it with are trustworthy, you know, there's just not a problem at all. Yeah. It's, if you have to question it, then don't do it more than likely. <laughs> um, it's about the yep. best answer for all of these. Indeed. All right. So the next question is wildlife rehabilitation so if you see an animal that's hurt will you try and help it um uh, the best practice i would say is that if you see an injured animal maybe it's like a i don't know like a bird with an injured wing and it's kind of on the ground it looks like it's struggling to just take a lift off or anything or it's a mammal that's you know has a problem of any sorts really um i would say try not to move it if you can if it's maybe in like a really busy street then Try to pull off on the side of the road. Be responsible, like I said. Be safe about it. But see if you can kind of move it off to the side in a safer spot. Um, but more often than not, if maybe you're on like a side trail and no one else is around and you see some injured bird, I would probably try my best to not touch it because you can actually harm it further. If it's a really you know small and sensitive animal, uh, you might stress it out even more and that could kill it, honestly. But what it, the best thing I would do is, and this is what I do, is I actually have um, set on my phone contacts, the at least for my county um, and even surrounding counties, honestly, is I have the phone numbers for all the different wildlife rehabilitators that um, you can uh, basically just call up and they will come and save the animal. And I, I just make sure to have a professional. That's a great idea. It. Yeah, yeah. And that way, you know, I've never had this happen, you know, knock on wood, but like if you ever did see an injured animal, I would just do that. Mm -hmm. And like you said, there are some ex exceptions. If it's in a road and it's clearly still alive, uh, I would definitely move it. Um, but besides that, I don't think there's really a reason to touch any animals ever. Um, and you got to be careful too. Some animals are more aggressive than you might think. Um, and vice versa. You don't know how that touch will affect an animal. Cause there's, you know, depends. Yeah. It's, like I said, it's something I've haven't I haven't had the like really experience, but I mean, if it was in that case, I would just try to not touch it as much as possible. And plus, they even have a lot of like birds and stuff. They have like diseases that you may contract and stuff that you really don't want to risk yourself either. Mm. And when you think about wild animal animals, they've been in crazy places. You know, they live out in nature, so yeah, you, know, you just don't want to touch them. It's just kind of gross. Yeah, the, re the rehabilitators. On top of the diseases, yeah. Yeah, the, these rehabbers are certified to, you know, take care of the animal, treat it. They have the proper caging, towels or whatever to, you know, transport them to a, you know, reputable center 
probably in your area and they can, you know, rehabilitate it and bring it back to its natural habitat. Hopefully at least sometimes they have to euthanize them, uh, which is just, you know, it is what it is. That's just, mm-hmm. but at nature. least you're doing it in a humane way. Yeah. In the yeah. proper way. Yeah. So I recommend that just do your research, um, get maybe the local phone numbers of some and that way you have them with you at all times. I know there are some people say they had an animal on the road and they want to, they put it, they take it in their own hands and put them out of their misery. Um, I don't know how I really feel about that. I'm not a huge fan of that because I know there's some people that'll just drop a rock on their head or something once they've hit them. (laughs) Um, I, I, I know I've had a family member that did that before and it just did not sit right with me. I don't know. I, I can understand where they're coming from, but like, you know, it's like, why have it suffer? But yeah, you know, at the same time, it's just, I see a lot of roadkill in my area. So it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's one of those things that just kind of happens. Look at it as like population control. I mean, that's kind of harsh, but it kind of is in a way, especially with deer, at least in Ohio. And speaking of deer in Ohio, I believe I might be, wrong on this. I, um, I haven't checked in a while, but I remember on my temps test for my license, uh, I believe you have up to, I think it's 48 hours to collect a deer carcass after you hit it. So that's for like the driver that hits it or something. So mm-hmm. uh, I did like, how do they, how do they even tell though? Like that you hit it, I guess it's just kind of, kind of a, like big dent in your car. <laughs> I don't know. Kind of a <laughs> civic duty, not like, a they won't prosecute you on it, but Oh, I guess no, no. I think it's basically saying if like you hit one and you want to collect the body for I don't know food, I guess. Or <laughs> oh, so it's her personal gain. I thought it was like for the sake of that. Yeah, no, it's it's animal. for like. Yeah, I believe oh. it's. I believe. It, I mean, I guess you have to call it in in that case. But yeah, I. I mean, I remember seeing that as a question. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, you have up to two days to collect this. Jeez. Yeah, it's interesting. That might have changed though. That was a couple of years ago when I took that test, but. Uh, yeah, I believe it's something. We've got like some that. weird laws in this country. I'll tell you. <laughs> you can shoot people on your property. You can collect uh-huh. deer carcass. Yeah, it's it's. We live in a interesting country and world. <laughs> so the yeah. next thing is uh, basically it's all about trash and garbage. Um, obviously, the, the quick answer is definitely not. Don't throw away your trash. Always pack it in, pack it out. No matter where you are, doesn't matter. Um, two really, I think pertinent examples. Uh, one's my own, but another one is uh, Ben Horn. He's always finding these Mylar balloons, little inflatable balloons. You get like, you know, party city or whatever your, you know, craft stores. And he seems to find them in so many places. He goes like Zion, death Valley. And I'm always seeing, you know, repost photos or even in his videos, just finding these Mylar balloons They get swept by the wind, I guess. And they just find their way into the environment. And of course, certain materials like that take, hundreds if not thousands of years to decompose in some cases um, depending on where they land and so i I wouldn't recommend that obviously Uh, just be responsible don't throw trash anywhere it's so disheartening to me to see clumps of trash in like a creek or at you know like a spillway or something where Mm -hmm. water flows from a you know underneath a highway bridge it's just terrible i've seen it so much Mm -hmm. Um, and try to do your own part too and try to pick up some of that you could even get yeah. like a those little trash claw things if yeah. you want. I don't have one, but I have seen people do that. Um, I, I always it's keep- just it's just sad how how much trash there is. Uh, down the hill from me is Cherokee Park, which is a pretty big park, but it has one of the most polluted creeks in Kentucky. Um, there's toilet paper, heroin needles, glass. <laughs> it's just disgusting, and it's just disheartening. Yeah, um, it's obviously obviously don't pick up the heroin needles, please don't, or the glass. Oh no, but... no, no, try not to. At least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's uh, I kind of referenced it earlier, but um, there's this place called Mad River Gorge near me, and they actually it's a newly open place. It's been open less than three years now, and the since it's like a gorge and it has you know flowing waterways through it, um, it, c- it accumulate a lot of trash over time, and they've been doing some massive restoration efforts there to just take out all the trash and you walk the trails. It's a gorgeous place. It's totally no pun intended. It's a gorgeous place. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I had to, but um, there's just so much trash that it's just so disheartening. So uh, when I went there actually to shoot my on location video and you can see in that video um, is that I actually, at the end of the day, my visit there, 
um, they give you these five gallon buckets at the trailhead and they tell you um, if you're visiting to fill it up with trash. And I filled mine like way up to the brim in like a few minutes. There's just so much trash there. It is like insane. Um, so I'm hoping it's changed over time because it's been a while since I've been there. But um, it's, yeah, it's just truly really disheartening to see all that, you know, happening. And uh, just don't be an idiot, people. <laughs> it's not that hard to carry like a little candy wrapper or something. It's not, it's really not. Or just find the nearest trash receptacle. You know, it's not that hard. <laughs> And at, at the very least, do not produce any trash. You know? Yeah, pack in. Uh, and it's the same thing with like camping. You know, I I don't have a problem with people camping. You know, in most places, but just leave nothing. No matter what it is, leave nothing. Yeah, always always pack out what you pack in. That's kind of like one of the mottos I think of of leave leave no trace. Um, actually, one more recent example <laughs> happened a few days ago. I was out uh, through hiking at Caesar Creek State Park and. I it was early morning, you know, I was just along the trail, just making my miles in. And I saw off to the side near the lake, um, cause it wraps around the lake. Cause it's this big, like 12 mile trail I was on is I saw this literally just a, it looked like someone had to cook out right there by the lake. And I've, I, this is probably one of the worst examples, honestly, I've seen in a long time. They had a giant charcoal bag just laying there, little charcoal coals on the ground. There was like, like sauce bottles, glass bottles, like dip trays, some like plastic bags. It literally looked like a cookout. Like just no, I'm mean like it had like a cookout Jeez. like the, the night before or something. And I not only that, I saw the packaging like a like a small box for a portable charcoal grill. And I like stopped my wow. watch because I was like timing my hike, and I was just like staring at this. And I'm like, uh, like just so infuriated. I was like, this is not. Who would who thinks in their right mind? And they were like, get this, they're only like a mile away from the trailhead. Doing this un, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, not unsolicited, just un uh, authorized, stupid. I guess. Stupid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, plainly stupid. Yeah, like cookout. Just, it just, I just was so baffling. It's like, if even, I'll even give them some leniency. If they did that cookout and they brought everything, all the trash, packed it out, and I didn't see it, well, obviously I wouldn't know it happened. And I'd be, I would honestly be okay with it. I mean, that's with like a big, asterisk right next to it because not really but the fact that they just left pretty much everything there and it looked like it looked like just they just up and left you know or something it was just terrible i just uh that infuriated me i haven't seen something that bad in a while so just yeah. don't because who's gonna have to pick it's it very, up very very disheartening yeah i mean i, I mean i guess yeah. you could have i guess some people could argue like why didn't you pick it up ryan but like i was hiking um and i don't expect this i mean Unfortunately, I see a lot of that, but I don't expect to be have to take care of other people's trash and their refuse. Uh, it's it's just terrible. And for coronavirus reasons too, you know, people have been eating that stuff probably the night before. So yeah, it, no, this is there. want to deal with that. Like all the stuff was still open, just laying there. It was like it looked like they just up and left. Like if they got kicked out, like someone saw it, or if they just were like, "Oh, I'm done," and they just went back to the trailhead, less than a mile away. Yeah, it was just awful. Anyways, dumb that's my, people. Dumb that's my, people. That's my rant. Just don't, don't leave your trash. It's not that bad. You can take it. I mean, would you, would you say that's down. the worst, worst trash you've ever seen? That's definitely one of the worst ones I've seen. There was a lot of it, and uh, yeah, it's the worst one in recent memory that I can think of. But um, there's this, there's this one park uh, for me. My worst. Um, there's this one park in Louisville that people seem to really like to dump their mattresses at. And it's just disgusting. I don't know why people do it. But I'll probably see, like, a couple mattresses a month there. I don't understand it, but it's just so rude. And it's just terrible. And I, I'm sure some poor park workers have to, like, carry those out of there. Ugh. Oh, yeah. So many car tires. I've seen a few mattresses in my time. Uh, I've even seen kitchen sinks, and I think I saw a bathtub somewhere. No joke. Yeah. I don't know how that stuff washes up in a creek. Like, yeah. Like it's like dammed up in the creek somewhere, but it's it's possible. Yeah, there's some weird stuff, man. You see out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more funny thing I saw. I don't know if you could consider this trash. This is just the weirdest thing. It was last weekend. So there's this like broken down, abandoned, rusty car in this in the mm. middle of a nature center. It was like at the bottom of a cliff. I have no, well, not really at the bottom of a cliff, but it was like in an area that a car never could have gotten to. 
and it was sandwiched between a tree. So like there's literally a tree in the middle of a car and there's like no <laughs> physical way of the car getting there. I just, I just want to imagine the story of that. But I just can't. I, I don't get it. I should have taken a picture of it. But it was like the weirdest thing. Don't that's leave your cars in the forest, guys. That's that's my number one tip. I, yeah, I've, I've seen many a time uh, like rusted fight bike frames, and I've seen a few like big chunks of car parts, like car hoods, and half of the body just laying there on the you know the wood. It's it's yeah. interesting. There's even a place where there's like a street car just laying there in the middle of the woods, but it's actually kind of like a landmark for like the Metro Park. So because mm-hmm. it used to be like a railway, I guess it's interesting. But yeah, so yeah, that's quite a few number of uh, best practices and things that me and Henry do to um, be ethical, both in our photography and just how we approach nature and wildlife. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess the final sound off here, um, I'm going to ask you, Henry. Yeah. Is, do you consider yourself more of a photojournalist or do you consider yourself more of a, um, I guess I'll say fine art photographer. Um, and what I mean is basically is that do you shoot to advocate for social and environmental causes or do you just shoot to create a nice image to share on social media mm-hmm. or let's say print? I mean, obviously I, I could do more work in the advocation department, but I'm always shooting images with those principles in mind. I, I, I really do have a lot of work to, to to go towards though um i guess like, do you, I, I don't do you expect every nature photographer to do that to be a photojournalist and advocate i don't expect every i don't think the nature photographers have to advocate for natural areas i think they just have to shoot with the principles in mind if that makes sense mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. see i i don't i may not directly advocate on my social media but i am involved for example i'm involved with this uh, climate change student commission thing. So I do definitely cool. advocate for nature in other ways. Um, yeah. What about you? Um, I, I try my, like, kind of like you, I kind of lean towards more just shooting nice imagery that's artful and that I can share with people in print and, sh- you know, selling galleries. Galleries are a big part of my work. Um, but at the same time, when it comes to, you know, sharing an image. I also like to, if I can capitalize on, uh, maybe if it's like a rare bird species, then I'll definitely, you know, write a caption about that or tell a story to someone about it. Um, but kind of like you, I, I do need to do, I th- feel like I do kind of lack a little bit in the advocation department. Um, but I definitely, mm-hmm. I definitely approach my work. Um, as you can see with all these ethics we listed here in the episode, um, that I definitely approach that with that kind of mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that I one, feel like- one guy I know is great with that. It's exploring nature 49 or also known as uh, MK. He's, he's great yeah. with conservation. I know he has his own charity work that he's done before and always very good about that. Yeah, de- definitely. Um, I, to answer, I guess my own question I asked you, um, do I expect every nature photographer to do that? No, not necessarily. Um, it's definitely comes down to what you, ex- you know, really want to have out of your experience in nature and you know you can still follow ethics but you don't have to be advocating necessarily for conservation photography if that makes sense you know it's Mm -hmm. it's it's not all you know one the same um but you could definitely be like me and henry here where it's like we just do a little bit of both and we you know advocate for that but we also like to make great imagery as well i feel like it just needs to be something that you know it's something you should always ask yourself in uh in the work you do and what you want to promote but i feel like it's good to be both if that if that actually answers it just be both yep all right well um so i think that pretty much wraps up the ethics uh discussion do you have any announcements right um not really um i did get in the mail the other day um two photo books from cozy books and um, they're both uh, adam gibbs is quiet light and ben horns uh, between the wind and both, awesome. are, yeah, both, I pre-ordered those months ago and they're both incredible, um, just massive inspiration, um, especially in particular Ben's book, um, at least, you know, like the first half of that book is just fall foliage that he's taken. Cause he always goes to the uh, those Zion, maple trees. Yeah. He always goes to Zion national park, um, every fall. And he's done that for like the better part of about 10 years or so now. And since we're right now in fall, it's been very inspirational. To look at that. And then, uh, Adam gives his book quite light. It's, kind of like just a retrospective and it kind of just 
encompasses and like i think it's about 100 pages so almost about 100 photos or so 100 pages really wow yeah i, I think it's around it's close to 100 i believe um so how there. long is uh ben horns uh, about the same yeah about the same mm-hmm. um adam's book though it kind of just encompasses his whole storied career over decades he's been uh, outdoor photographer but um so that kind of awesome. has just a good overview of different imagery he's taken um obviously landscapes are his forte and uh same with ben's of course but yeah, this yeah, that that, uh, that Ben Horn book might have to be my first photo book. I, I can see myself getting they, that. <laughs> I know the uh, Adam one is on its second edition, um, and that's the kind I have. But it has a nice a nice cover to it. But um, mm-hmm. I think you can still order Ben's. I believe um, it just came out like a couple weeks ago. Officially came out. But uh, like I said, I pre-ordered it months ago because I was really excited mm-hmm. for it. But yeah, and two Ben good, and two Adam, good. Ben and Adam, if you happen to be listening. Which you aren't, but if you are, we'd love to have you on the show. Uh, yes, in I fact, can you could be our third host. You know, just you know, hit <laughs> us up. <laughs> we can dream, right? Um, the only other announcement is uh, just yesterday I did my first uh, freelance gig with the local wetlands association. So I finally got started doing an ongoing working awesome. relationship. I know I've been talking about it kind of on and off here on the podcast, but um, yeah, yesterday was the first job. Pretty much just photographing a for an hour or so these uh, events, and it was about the neighborhood that was surrounding this wetland area that kind of newly opened. And I was just photographing um, some of our trustees and the president of the association, who was uh, basically just taking them on a guided hike. And I was kind of just like a fly on the wall. It's kind of nice. I could just kind of be out of the way. I'm not talking, and I'm just photographing people in a group. It was pretty easy. Um, so That's cool. yeah, but I'm ex- I'm excited for future um, huh. jobs, I guess. In, with doing, you know, working with mm-hmm. this association. But uh, how about you? Uh, before I talk about myself, I just want to say Ryan came out with a really good covered bridge photography series. Um, <laughs> I was done talking about it. I don't it, know. Okay. <laughs> I forget how many episodes there are, but um, three, it, three. it was a really good series. So make sure you check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, so for me, uh, not too much. Uh, I got a battery grip this week, which is fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just thought I should mention. Um, Go ahead, man. Let's see. I I really did a lot of photography this weekend. Um, I went to, like I said, the largest waterfall in Indiana. Fortunately, the lighting was pretty bad because I was just driving through, so I didn't, you know, I didn't have time to wait for the weather. Um, it was bright sky bright highlights so there's dark shadows bright highlights um i still got maybe four or five decent shots which is pretty good actually uh it was two separate falls so it's a lower falls and upper falls it was just amazing stunning um and then i Hmm. got some amazing or pretty good hawk photos this weekend as well uh i did a nice session today so i got some hawk photos and I also was chasing, well, I wasn't chasing ducks, <laughs> speaking of ethics, but I was uh, taking some nice uh, <laughs> mallard photos as well. So I'm pretty excited about those. So make sure you follow my Instagram uh, to check those out. Um, I do want to say, I if you follow my YouTube, I haven't been posting much recently. And there is a reason. Uh, I'm working on the application for Governor's School for the Arts in Louisville or in Kentucky. Uh, and that's quite the process. It's a film and photography intensive summer program. Um, so you have to make like a short film and stuff for that. So I've been kind of putting my energy towards that since I am pretty busy. So YouTube will resume eventually, but for now I really want to focus on, uh, the application process for that. So that's pretty much it for me. Congrats. Yeah. I mean, I hope you do well, at least that sounds awesome. Uh, Yeah. I, I applied last year, um, did not make it, but, um, it's a pretty cool program. If, if you get in, it's pretty nice. You can pretty much get a scholarship to any Kentucky college, like a full ride. So it's definitely oh, wow. high stakes on that program. Yeah, it's like no pressure, but yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a three-week intensive. You live on a college campus, and all day, 12 hours a day, you learn film and photography. Oh, dude, that sounds sick. Yeah. I'd I love think, it. Yeah. I, I think it'll do well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have, I have friends who've gotten in and they've met new friends and learned so much from it. So. Oh, yeah, no doubt. You network with everyone. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. very neat. Yep. So on that note, I just leave you with one uh, parting little phrase. I saw it on a little trailhead, actually. Um, at a, I've seen a couple of places actually I've gone to around my area. Um, take only pictures, kill nothing but time, leave nothing but footprints. Think about that for a second. 
It's a good little saying, I think. That I didn't a, come up with that it. That is a I great would... adage. Uh, you, yeah. I want we'll you guys to adage. memorize that by the next podcast episode and say it back to us. Uh, that's your homework <laughs> for the week. That uh, will be on the Put podcast. that into practice in your own nature of photography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.